Well, the Magi have arrived, so it must be Epiphany <laughs> in, in their full glory. Also, Peter has arrived, our new director of music. He has been here this week. We are so excited about having him and excited about the things that we are going to do together. Uh, he is going to be, bring us many gifts and a, a lot of excitement and energy, and we're going to have a lot of fun as we go forward into the future. So you'll be hearing from him very soon. But we're just very honored to have Peter Infanger as our new Director of Music Ministries. Have a number of uh, announcements to lift up. We will have communion tonight at our 5 o'clock service this evening. Our Wednesday activities get going again with our dinner and our Bible studies. If you're coming to the Acts study this week, in, in both of my fall studies, I didn't quite get finished with Luke. So we've got one more week of Luke, but then we're going to jump right back into Acts. So if you were looking for Acts to begin, it'll begin a week after. But... I just come on anyway, and Luke blends into Acts anyway, and it just, just, just flows right together. Uh, we've got several fun things going on on our evening services coming up. On the third Sunday, we're going to have a family night dinner. Then on the fourth Sunday of the month, uh, we have a Hannah Lena concert. Hannah Lena, of course, formerly known as Nash Street, formerly known as two of the finest young women ever to grow up into this church, and just another example of the talent that has come out of this church. And they'll be doing a concert uh, fundraising for our youth choir and some of our mission projects on the 27th and you can see the young people for tickets for that uh, a lot of things in our bulletin as we start this new year uh, please take note of the sympathies because with the holidays sometimes you miss things and, and, and we've just had several losses within our extended church family over the last week or so and I uh, know you want to take note of some of those but we're glad that you're here today we're excited about 2013 and there's a lot going to be happening this year, and hope that you will be a part of it. I want to remind you to sign the attendance pads that we have on the pews. We might have a record of you being here. And also, we need an additional family to help us with the attendance pads at the 11 o'clock at the close of the service. That's only one time. There's like five teams, so it's only one time every five weeks. But if you can help us with that, talk to Carol Reed of our evangelism committee, and we would appreciate that help. Now take your bulletins. Let's turn to our call to worship. In the stand, please. You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Most gracious God, we are thankful for the gift of the new year. We are thankful for the gift of your Son. Bless us as we reveal him to the world. Bless us in this time of epiphany. We have come to worship this day in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our hymn of praise is number 117. We'll sing stanzas 1, 3, 5, and 6. Number 117. Creed. And let's unite in this historic confession of our Christian faith. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the gift of the new year. We thank you for all of its possibilities and all of its challenges. We thank you for the exciting things that loom before us. We thank you for the chances to share the good news through word and deed with all the people with whom we come in contact. We thank you for the year past and we thank you for the joys that it brought us. But we look forward to moving into your future, living as disciples of Jesus Christ, claiming this time for your kingdom, helping to bring about your love and grace into our world, making them real through our actions. Help us. Help us to see what is needed. Help us to have the courage and the faith to step forward and do the things that you would have us to do so that we may proclaim, we may proclaim the good news that has touched our lives and changed our lives. As we come into this new year, we, we know that there are some who have struggles. We have friends who have lost a dear loved one just in the last few days. We have friends who sit by the bedside of a loved one. We have friends who are in the hospital and in recovery, getting well, re, re, rehabilitating an injury. They need your strength. They need your hope. They need your light. Help them to see you, to know you, to feel your presence in this new year. We pray all these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> now time for our children. I'd like for the children to meet me back here at the end of this aisle. Come on around this way, Kat. I'll meet you down here. We're just going to start over here for now. We won't do this every Sunday of this year, but since it's a new year, come this way. A little bit here, Mary. That's why I'm so glad you're here. Happy New Year. It's great to have you. We're in a new place today because have you ever traveled to a new place <coughs> and you didn't know how to get there? When, when you're going somewhere new and you don't know how to get there, you might stop and ask for directions. You might, do you know what this is? It's a map. That's right. You might look at the map so you would know where to go. I, let, I had my phone. I left it on the pew down there. The other day I had to go to somewhere in Tennessee where I'd never been before, and I just used my GPS on my phone, and it did a map for me the whole way there and back so I knew how to get there. My mama had that too. Does she have one of those too? Well, it helps us at, um, because, it, because sometimes we, need to, we have to have help knowing where to go. Now, I've got a map here, and I want you to try to follow this map to something new 
we're going to tell a story in just a minute, but to something new in our church. Now, let's kind of, I didn't give them a chance to look at it in early church. Let's kind of orient ourselves. This is where we are back at the back. This is the front. Here's the chancel rail. This is the altar table with the cross. Do you see where we are? Here's the organ and here's the piano. Kat, you want to hold the map and do you kind of see where to go? Go to the piano. This is north, south, east, and west. You go to the piano and turn northeast and go around the rail. Do you think you can follow the map and know how to get there? Do you, Will Evans? Okay, take the map. Y'all follow Will Evans and let's see where the map takes us. Go to the piano. Now, come back this way. Look, go to the... Will Evans, bring the map. Come here. You've got the... All right, well, here's the piano. Run here. Go run here to this edge of the piano, and then go up those steps. Yeah, there are a lot of pianos. This one, you're right. You, I see which one you were going to. You're exactly right. Now, come on up. Now, where's the star? Look on the map. Do you see somebody new up here that you're not used to seeing? That's Mr. That's Mr. That's Mr. Infanger. He's our new music director. Director of Music, you say hello and welcome to him. Hello. And you'll learn all their names before too long. They're a lot of fun. That's exactly right. All right, y'all have a seat right now. And I, I want to tell you a story about somebody else who was looking for something one time. About the time Jesus was born, the Bible tells us, I'm going to sit here so I don't have to get up off the floor. About the time Jesus was born, the Bible tells us that there were wise men in another country and they, they, we call them magi, and they probably were people that studied the stars. Well, they saw a new star appear, and they felt like that that new star was announcing the birth of a king. So they set out following the star to find the new king. Well, they got to Jerusalem, and they asked King Herod, where is the new king of the Jews? Well, King Herod wasn't very happy about that because he was the king, and he didn't want anybody taking over his kingdom. So he asked the religious leaders, he said, these guys are here looking for a king. They said there was a new star. So the religious leaders said, well, years ago, the prophet Micah said that the new king would come, would be born in Bethlehem. So Herod went back and told the wise men that, and he said, you might look in Bethlehem for them, and when you find him, make sure and come back and tell me where he is so I can come and worship him. I don't think Herod really wanted to do that, did he? But just as it happened, that the wise men followed the star on to Bethlehem, and they found, they found Jesus. Now, the end of the story with the wise men is that they were told in a dream, God told them in a dream, not to go back to Herod. So they went home a different way. But the important part of this story is they followed that star. They didn't have a map or a GPS, but God led them to find baby Jesus. We don't know how old Jesus was. He, Jesus might have been a few months old or even a couple years old by the time they got there because they had to come so far. But when they found Jesus, they looked and looked, and when they found him, they bowed down and worshipped him and gave him their gifts. And I think we can remember for today that wise men and wise women and wise boys and wise girls still seek Jesus today. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the lesson we learned from these wise men. Thank you for the way you showed Jesus to them. God, we ask you to show your son to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I need some help getting the wise men while we're singing. Our offertory hymn is number 221, In the Bleak Midwinter. Let's stand and sing all the verses.
Most gracious Heavenly Father, as we celebrate so many of your gifts, we do celebrate the gift of the Christ. And with these gifts, we honor his name and his work. We bring them to continue the building of your church and your kingdom. In the name of Christ, we come. Amen. You may be seated. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. Heaven's arches rang when the birds did sing, proclaiming thy royal decree. But of lowly birth didst thou come to earth, and in great humility. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is my heart for thee. The fox has found rest and the birds their nest in the shade of the forest tree. But thy couch was the sod, O thou son of God, in the deserts of Galilee. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, us, there is room in my heart for thee. Thou camest, O Lord, with the living word that should set thy people free. But with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn, they bore thee to Calvary. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. When the heaven shall ring and the angels sing at thy coming to victory, let thy voice call me home, saying, yet there is room, there is room at my side for thee. And my heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus, when thou comest and callest me. I got a new Bible for Christmas, large print. <laughs> Have to make some concessions. Second chapter of Matthew's Gospel, we know this story. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. 
And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them, till it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. bitter perfume breathes a life of gathering gloom sorrowing sign bleeding dying sealed in the stone cold tomb
We're going to have some fun. <laughs> yes, sir. Glad that Peter is here. When I first came to Mississippi State back in uh, 1975 as a freshman, the very first class I walked into was Freshman Honors English Comp. And there, Dr. Nancy Hargrove introduced me to the wonders of T.S. Eliot. She also introduced me to the wonders of transition sentences and the proper use of the comma, which apparently had eluded me in my high school years. <laughs> and for that, I'm very thankful because I, I've, I've done better since then. However, at 18, I was not so appreciative of the poetry of Mr. Eliot. I did try, but I'm not sure that, that, that poems that come with their own footnotes, and for which you have to have a working knowledge of Greek, Latin, French, and uh, German just to get off the first page, should be thrown at 18-year-old engineering students. But we tried anyway. However, some years later, while I was looking for a poem to end a good old three points in a poem sort of sermon, I stumbled back upon um, some of Mr. Eliot's Christian poetry. Now just as an aside to those of y'all who did not take your English at a good school like Mississippi State, uh, Thomas Stearns Eliot was born in St. Louis. He went to school at Harvard. He went to Paris and decided he needed to be an Englishman. So he came back, moved to London, settled in the Anglican Church, and uh, wrote some wonderful poems and won the Nobel Prize in literature. And then uh, as it might happen, he's probably most famous outside the English departments for having written the book that became the musical Cats. And I think that Victor Hugo is about to undergo a similar fate. That joke was for the English department. I've told engineering jokes. I've told ag jokes. That joke was for the humanities. They got, they got it. You know, y'all are, are a hard group to please sometimes. I figure the only joke that everybody's going to laugh at is when the preacher comes out in his pajamas, and we're just not going to do that one again. So. <laughs> in any event, as a young preacher, I stumbled over this poem called Journey of the Magi, which led me to a poem called Ash Wednesday, which led me to owning my very own copy of the poems and plays of T.S. Eliot, which is something that I'm sure neither I nor Dr. Hargrove would ever have anticipated back in 1975. So all you professors and other teachers who are about to jump back into the breach this week, take heart. You know, we may seem dull at the time, but a good Mississippi State education is never wasted. It may take a while for it to sink in, but what y'all do does matter. So just, just keep at it. I come to this poem today because it is epiphany season. The season of epiphany is about Christ being revealed to the world. And the day is Epiphany Sunday when we celebrate the coming of the Magi, however they may have dressed and looked at the time. These foreigners, wrong religion, wrong culture, wrong nationality, who come to honor the Christ child. The Bible really doesn't tell us a whole lot about the Magi, but it's fairly obvious from what it does tell us that they weren't from around here or around Judea or any place else like that. Theirs was a long journey, a, a difficult journey, a complicated one. And Mr. Eliot's poem has one of the Magi looking back on the journey from, from many, many years later. <coughs> a cold coming we had of it. Just the worst time of the year for a journey in such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And the camels galled, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet. Then the camel men cursing and grumbling and running away and wanting their liquor and women, and the night fires going out and the lack of shelters, and the cities hostile and the towns unfriendly, and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches, with the voices singing in our ears saying that this was all folly. Then at dawn we came down to a temperate valley, wet, below the snow line, smelling of vegetation, with a running stream and a water mill beating the darkness, and three trees on the low sky, and an old white horse galloped away in the meadow. And then we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel, 
six hands at an open door, dicing for pieces of silver, and feet kicking the empty wineskins. But there was no information. And so we continued, and arrived at evening, not a moment too soon, finding the place. It was, you may say, satisfactory. All this was a long time ago. I remember. And I would do it again. But set down this. Set down this. Were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. Now, Mr. Elliot may have taken some artistic license with his telling of the story, but the fact of the matter is, most everything we think we know about the story of the wise man comes from songs or nativity sets or somebody else's artistic license. The scripture story that we read just a few minutes ago, it's pretty sparse. And there are a lot of things it doesn't tell us. It, you know, there's no mention of camels there. It does not tell us the names of the wise men. In fact, it really doesn't tell us in the scripture story that there were three wise men. We get that from the fact that there were three gifts, and that is one wonderful detail the Scripture gives us. The gold, the frankincense, the myrrh. But so much else is left up to our interpretation and sometimes our imagination. Which is why over the years the thoughts about the Magi, and particularly what they thought and what they did after they had seen the Christ child, kind of come down around two different poles. On one end, there are those who think that the wise men were on a religious mission. That even though they were from the wrong place, the wrong religion, that the Magi and the Jewish people had come together in the time of Daniel. That the Persian exile had brought the Jewish people to the land of the Magi and that they had learned from each other. And that these Magi really did look for a Messiah. And that they had come seeking and hoping for a Messiah. And even though it's a little pluralistic, a little New Age-ish, the Magi came and went and told the story that the Messiah had come into the world. The other point of view is that the Magi were on a diplomatic mission, and it's known from other historians that they tended to do this, that they were ambassadors, that they were representatives of their country and their king. And they came with respect and with gifts, but they came seeking the successor to King Herod, not the savior of the world. They came, they paid their respects, they delivered their gifts, and then they went their way, never really knowing what they had seen, and never really knowing what they had missed seeing. I think Mr. Eliot's poem takes sort of a middle ground. His magi seemed to have discovered something that they weren't looking for. They came for the birth of a king with appropriate gifts and appropriate honors, but they left realizing that they had seen something more realizing that this child would do more than merely take Herod's place on the throne. They came away realizing that everything had changed. I'm not sure what they saw when they got to Bethlehem. I don't think there was a halo around the child like there are in medieval paintings. I don't think the child in the cradle or the manger or wherever he was at that time was doing magic tricks and doing miracles. But they saw something. When they saw this child, they saw something holy. They saw something powerful. They saw something God-given. They saw something sacred, something that convinced them that this child was a king, but more than a king, and that everything was now different. And while I'm sure that the Magi would have taken joy in seeing something so wonderful and something so holy, they also knew that this birth might be the death of the old ways might be the death of their ways, and that they would be the ones who returned to their kingdoms no longer at ease in the old dispensation, but in a new world where everything was new, everything was different, a world that had seen their time and passed them by, a world where their knowledge and their power and their skill paled in comparison to the power that had been unleashed in a manger in Bethlehem. You know, even when change is a good thing, change can be hard. 
Even when it's a good thing, change can be difficult when it means that so much of what you used to believe is simply no longer true. Interestingly, when, when Eliot wrote this poem, he had only recently become a Christian. He had grown up among Unitarians. He had gone to school, studied philosophy at Harvard, which even then was not a path to Orthodox theology. He had gone and studied Indian religions and Indian philosophies. But as he got to very close to being 40, for whatever reason, he came to the Anglican Church and joined that church and produced a number of distinctly Christian poems. I'm not sure what it was, but I think he was a lot like the Magi, steeped in other religions, steeped in other worldviews. But there's something about the Christ, whether he encountered him as a babe in Bethlehem, or in the Scriptures, or in the sacraments of the church, or in the work of the body of Christ in the world, that changed everything that revealed that Christ to him. Oddly enough, as much as we do with Christmas, and we do a lot, we sometimes overlook the significance of Christmas, particularly the theological significance of Christmas. We do pile too much onto the holiday sometimes. We enjoy the festivities a little too much. I think our Puritan ancestors went a little too far when they banned Christmas, but they were right in pointing out that some of our modern current Christmas celebrations depend more on ancient pagan holidays than on the scripture. But I think that on the other hand, if you get too caught up in arguing over dates or Roman holidays or even Santa Claus, some of our Christian ancestors, even some of our Christians that we know today, end up de-emphasizing Christmas altogether and trying to lift it up. They, they de-emphasize the miracle and the power and the majesty of the Incarnation. Because no matter when it originally occurred on the calendar, no matter if it was winter or summer, no matter if Mary rode a donkey or the wise men rode camels, no matter if our current celebrations have become too commercial or too secular, the essence of Christmas is that at a very real time, in a very real place, God acted in a mighty and powerful way to bring His presence into the world as it had never been done before. The essence of Christmas is Emmanuel, God with us. The essence of Christmas is that the very word and power of God came into our world as a tiny helpless little baby to help us understand more about God and to help us understand more about ourselves. And yes, that would lead to other events, earth-shattering events of the cross and the empty tomb. But the fact of the matter is, in that moment when God came to earth in the manger, the world changed. The world would never again be the same. And it's up to us for whom this is our story. This is our hope. This is our faith to live in such a way to show the world that we have encountered this baby and we have encountered this Christ and we have seen and known His holiness and His power and His love and that He has made a difference in our lives. Not clinging to old dispensations or the former gods, little g gods that ruled our lives, but going forward, following Jesus into God's time and into the world into which God has come. We are here to live as disciples, to live as people who have seen something Something that has changed the world. Something that has changed us. And it's our task to go out in love. To go out in service. To go out living. To go out in our words and deeds and everything we are. To proclaim the revelation of Christ. To proclaim the good news. To proclaim that God has been revealed to our world through the miracle of a baby in a manger. And because of that, we're no longer the same. And our world is no longer the same. That's our mission as Christmas people, as epiphany people, to so live, to show that this wonderful event has made a difference, has made a difference in our lives, 
has made a difference in our world, has made a difference that changed everything. That's our mission, to go out into this world telling that story. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, help us to be Christmas people. Help us to be Epiphany people. Help us not to be afraid, but to know the power of Christ to make things different, to make things better, to make things right. Help us to live it out as we go into your world. We pray in his most holy, precious name. Amen. As we come to our final hymn, we open the doors of our church to any who would be a part of this church family. We'd be glad to meet you here at the altar. The hymn is number 256. We'll stand and sing verses 1 and 5. Number 256. to you Scott Helms. Scott and his wife Amy, his Amy, Amy's a member here, but have been attending for some time and wanted to become a, he wanted to join formally and become a part of this church. He comes from another denomination. We accept his Christian baptism, his profession of faith, and I ask you this, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and uphold it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? Yes, sir. We are honored to have you, and I'm going to ask Scott to stand here, and you can greet him at the close of the service. I'm going to ask Peter to come down after the benediction and after the uh, after all the music is finished, that you might welcome him to our church family as well. But we are glad that you are here to share this service today. We are glad to be going into a brand new year together. It's going to be a good time, an exciting time. Appreciate all of your support and help. Now may you go in peace, knowing that the love of God your Father, grace through His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the power and the comfort of the Holy Spirit go with you. Mm -hmm.